in the 1980s, George Lucas was talking about garage filmmakers and how they were going to change the world. I think it happened. We're in this to pay homage to something that really inspired us all. It's a testament to how powerful your work is if other people want to recreate it. I think the line between being a fan and being a celebrity is totally blurred. The internet has changed the entertainment industry drastically. You don't really need to go to Hollywood and convince some big dude in a suit to give you some money. All you need is the support of people that believe in what you're doing. People have always taken the stories that were significant to them and retold them. The difference is that the stories today belong to the studios. They can collect it, they can appreciate it, they can fantasize about it, but they can't steal it. It's a question of, can you afford a half million dollar in legal bill? Because if you can't, we're going to pulverize you. It's still the Wild West out there, because I think everybody's still asking themselves, how do I get noticed, and how do I make money from getting noticed? Fan film is taking an intellectual property and doing with it what you will. It's using the things around you to create something brand new that it wasn't intended for. These are people who are taking video cameras and these characters that we all know and saying, I'm going to create something brand new out of it. Switch off, will ya? I'm trying to get a signal. You don't have to have $100 million to make a movie. You have editing software on your phone these days. Go make a movie. It's more passion, less skill, but the passion makes up for it. Growing up in Mississippi in the 1980s, Indiana Jones was one of the most amazing things that I'd ever seen on screen in my whole life. It was real, it was uh, visceral, and Harrison Ford's energy was so big, and he was a one-man show with a bullwhip and a gun and a leather jacket, and he looked cool, and he was awesome, and everything that I was not. I mean, what little boy wouldn't want to be Indiana Jones? And so I just decided to try to take it a step further. And so I was riding the school bus, and I met this kid named Eric Zala. And I shared with him the Raiders of Lost Ark comic book. And I said, hey, I'm remaking Raiders of Lost Ark, and do you want to help? And he said, sure. Little did he know that really the only thing that I had done is just cast myself as Indiana Jones. Jason Lamb is a third Raiders guy. He did all the camera work, he did all the special effects, he did all the makeup. It focused our summers, it gave us something to do. And we were all being raised by single mothers or living in dysfunctional households, so I think Raiders was a wonderful escape. I was this pudgy little Greek kid running around in Indiana Jones costume for seven years. The passion was there. They went to the film, they said, okay, we're gonna go do the same thing. And they have no idea how that film was made. They just tried to mirror how the film was made. It's outstanding, it's impressive. You pick up your camera and, and you call up your buddy and say, hey, let's go, with no money in the middle of a swamp in Mississippi. And you do this every summer for like seven years. 
I mean, some of the, the stuff that they did was amazing. I mean, the, the truck that they used for the truck scene didn't have a motor. It didn't have brakes. So they jerry-rigged their own brakes with just a couple of chunks of wood and some string. It's shot for shot. That's one of my favorite scenes, because it embodies that kick-ass fan energy that you love to see when fans really go for it. You sit back and people go, oh my god, there is a child hanging off the front of this moving vehicle. Awesome. They set themselves on fire, which is insane. It's real. This is not a special effect. This is not CGI. That 14-year-old kid is on fire. Oh, my God. Don't do this at home, kids. When you watch the, their movie, it's a visceral experience because you're like, yes, you're watching Indiana Jones fighting you know, the bad guys, but you're also praying, you know, let these kids get out alive. You know, let them not kill themselves you know, or, or wind up you know, in, the, in the hospital for the rest of their lives. Is the Raiders adaptation the greatest fan film that was ever made? I would argue that it's the best. Let it go. Some people may wonder, what is the difference between a fanarchist and Quentin Tarantino? Uh, because they both are doing an homage of a sort. And I guess the biggest difference is about $100 million. It's the question of being backed by a studio and having an agent and having a legal team and being distributed in 2,000 theaters. There are lots of filmmakers who appropriate ideas from other films. Quentin Tarantino is, is, a very, is very well known for copying from previous films. Kill Bill was sort of the pinnacle for him. That was almost like a mashup of every kung fu film he, he loved. It was kind of smushed into that movie. George Lucas was well known for copying from Western films and early science fiction films and war movies. Like all those bits and pieces made their way into the Star Wars films. Now people can do this all at home, on, on their home computers. It's really put a gray line between what a fan is and what a professional is. My definition of a professional is if you're making money at it. A lot of people just want to make a film. They want to play in other people's sandboxes. They want to play with the character that they grew up with. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Anybody who tells a story is going to speak from their base of knowledge and their lifetime's accumulated experience. I'm actually doing a film about this version of Storm. I'm totally checking this out. That is awesome. I grew up in an all-white suburb of Houston, Texas, during a time when all of the people around me, adults included, had no qualms about expressing their disgust towards a little girl for having brown skin. There was no like active search for role models because in the world that I was growing up in, I just got to a point where I assumed that there weren't any. And then at some point when I was about 10 years old, I was walking through a mall and there was an arcade and the entire side of an X-Men arcade game was an image of Storm. She's surrounded by lightning. She's wearing leather, and she's got a mohawk. So I remember that moment vividly. Like, I want it to be that chick. No one's going to mess with her. Storm has had a lot of different incarnations. And the more common images are the standard long hair and high heels and no pants, which seems to be the norm for female superheroes. They can't wear pants. And her power is that she can control and manipulate the weather. When the first X-Men film was coming out, I was excited not because I was a huge X-Men fan, but as a black woman, I was thrilled to know that Hollywood was going to give life to a black female superhero. And so when I saw her, she was meek. <laughs> There was a scene where one of the bad guys it turns into water in front of her, and she gets scared and runs from the room. Her name is Storm. She can kill you with lightning or a tsunami, 
And so how is that a background character? How is that someone that should ever be portrayed as passive or confused? It kind of broke my heart. And I was like, what is that? It's not Storm. She's very pretty. Halle Berry is very pretty. But that's not Storm, <laughs> you know? Fan films fulfill a need where fans are saying, you know, that's good, but it, there's a part of it that doesn't represent me, so I'm going to remix and rework what you've come up with in order to reflect what I want to see there. When I said out loud through social media that I was going to make this film, it resonated so fast. People that I don't know instantly were saying like, oh, this is so great that this is happening. People were using the word need, like I need this to happen and I need it to be awesome. If I'm getting that response, like, what if an actual movie studio <laughs> could give attention to that? The audience is there. It's there. <laughs> Fans are getting to participate in the movies and stories that they love, whether it's through fan fiction or these fan movies. They're all feeling empowered to go out there and find a character. It's like they do when they come to a convention. They dress up in their favorite character. They role play. They're getting to be part of that world that they love. Without story, there is no culture. Story has driven, you know, from, from the days of, of us sitting around the campfire in caves, creating language, story comes from that. And I think now with the internet, what it's done is it's taken us full circle. Now we're able to connect with each other all over the world, and you see all these different tribes forming of niches of people that are interested in the same subjects. You look around at Comic-Con right now, and you see all the fans dressed up as their favorite characters with their own personal twist on it. Comic-Con San Diego, international, baby. Let's blow this up, bring the tribe together, Comic-Con. It used to be that if a movie was going to get made, it had to pass through a big wig in Hollywood who had to think it was a money-making venture, and if it was not a money-making venture, that was a story that was not going to be told. Well, now we live in a world through places like Kickstarter and other crowdfunding websites like Indiegogo and others, where we as the viewers can decide the stories that we want to hear. I was on Twitter and I took a picture of my favorite panel of ElfQuest and I said, ElfQuest anyone? Just random with a hashtag. And my Twitter feed blew up. And everyone was like, I love that, I love that. And one of the loudest voices was my producing partner, Paula Rhodes. We got in touch with the creators. They are the most open-hearted, wonderful people in the world. They said, you know, the rights are over at Warner Brothers right now, but from a fan fiction point of view, um, what have you done? We sent them, uh, you know, projects that we had produced before and they said, we love the quality of your work go for it. Um, and so we did. We raised about $10,000 on Indiegogo through fans from all over the world, because ElfQuest has been published in 12 countries, 10 languages. Raised that in a week, got an article in the New York Times, dragged 13 scantily clad women into the woods for three days, and shot a four and a half minute fan trailer. It's a beautiful story. It's um, quest. It's the young hero. It's love. It's war. It's death. It's all that good stuff. We just wanted to show our love for that, really, as something that really touched us as kids, showed us heroines, and probably pushed us into the entertainment sphere. And was hoping that it would rally everyone, that a studio would make a movie. And so when the rights reverted to Wendy and Richard, they were getting some interest from other studios. And um, Paul and I were driving home, and we were like, what could we do to update the brand? And so we put together a pitch, and they said, yes. They said, you are fans, you get it, and we got the film and TV option. <laughs> this is something that we've loved since we were around eight years old. We want to do it justice. We want to do it right. In case you're wondering how long I have been a Star Trek fan, we'll just show a bit of it so you can see what a nerd I am, so you know I'm not joking. You ready? Yeah! 
Have you ever seen a scrawnier Captain Kirk in your life? Report's about. Starfleet's communique was accurate. All three power stations in this system are completely drained. Any idea what caused it? Aye, likely the Klingon sealing fuel cells again. There is no evidence to support that theory, Mr. Scott. That's because it wasn't a theory. It was a joke. Power stations were anchored in this system with the purpose of providing energy and fuel for passing Federation ships. And what would cause a failure on this game? Unknown. I have made a lot of friends over the years in production. And one thing I, I found in common with these guys is when they were little kids, they loved Star Trek. But now they've developed professional level skills in all these different fields. So we got together and we acquired a 9,000 square foot facility in Jacksonville, Florida, where we began rebuilding the original soundstage. I mean, within inches of the original layout. And the very fact that everybody's there and they're not making one penny, that tells you how much they must love what they're doing. Take us out of here, Mr. Sulu. Ahead, warp two. Aye, sir. Our long range goal is to kind of complete the five year mission. If you remember, uh, you know, these are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. It's, it's five year mission. To explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations. Well, they only did three years. So we would love to pick up right where the original series left off. Once upon a time, there weren't a lot of fan films. You know, I went out and searched for fan films. Nowadays, they kind of come to me, I get emails. I have a site, Fan Film Follies. There's a gazillion of them. You can certainly break them up into different groups. There's uh, the fantasy, there's horror, there's superhero, there's sci-fi. You can break it up even bigger than that. There's Star Wars fan films or Star Trek fan films. Or there's X-Files, G.I. Joe, Harry Potter, Stargate, Batman. A lot of people think that they're an internet phenomenon, but they go back way, way beyond that. As long as people have had access to cameras, they've been making their own movies of fan films. Don Glute, I consider him the godfather of fan films. Even though fan films were made before him, uh, he made a shitload of them. The way I got started was um, I went to see a, a movie called The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms when it first came out, and it pushed buttons on me. An armored giant wreaking his prehistoric fury on modern man and his puny machines. Populations crazed and panicked with fear by its destructive force. The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. I wanted to show that movie in my house anytime I wanted to. But you couldn't buy movies in those days. There was no VHS or DVD or Betamax or anything like that. And so I said, the only way I'm going to show this dinosaur movie in my house is to make it myself. And that was my first experience. I was nine years old. We shot it in the backyard with a Ollie the Dragon, you know, hand puppet attacking a little town that was from my model train layout. And uh, it was a terrible movie, but the experience of it, it didn't look terrible to me at the time. It was the effort that registered with me. Don Glute made over 40 fan films uh, over the space of over 10 years, starting from when he was nine years old and he wasn't allowed to touch the camera. His mom ran the camera for him while the little nine-year-old directed. And then I saw my first Frankenstein movie. I started making my own Frankenstein, Dracula, Wolfman movies. And just one thing kind of led to another. He went to films, he, he watched the film, he went home and he tried to mirror what he saw in the film. One was Spy Smasher versus the Purple Monster. That was a serial. Captain America versus the Mutant. Frankenstein meets Dracula. And then I did a lot of superhero films after that. But I never set out to start making films. I wanted to show them. All these people were making movies in their garage in their backyard, but nobody knew about anybody else doing it because there's no distribution. You show it to your mom, you show it to your best friend, and then you're done. It kind of underlines why Troops was such a, a game changer. Troops is filmed on location with the men of the Imperial forces. All suspects are guilty, period. Otherwise, they wouldn't be suspect, would they? 
the group of filmmakers that I hung out with, we were discussing comic books and parodies. One of them said, you know, it'd be really funny if you crossed Cops, the TV show uh, that was a Fox show, with Star Wars. And we kind of laughed and uh, nobody was going to take it. So I asked if I could and it went from there. Okay, well, what I'm gonna do now, sir, is place you under imperial arrest so we can only help. Hey, am I talking to you? Am I talking to you? Then stay over there and shut your mouth. I didn't go into it trying to start a genre that's now become known as fan film. I was just trying to make something for my reel to get noticed. It was kind of circulating as a gray market video in Hollywood, but really didn't get much play until it hit the web. It would take you 24 to 48 hours to download the film. We were crashing sites all over the eastern seaboard. And that's when we started getting the publicity. Uh, shut the camera off. Time magazine named it the number one Star Wars fan film ever in history. And um, it's been called the first viral video in the history of the internet before there was such a word. Most people would call this the ass into space, but I like the small town feeling you get around here. I mean, we know everybody. We did take into account that we wouldn't be able to make any money from it, and we even have in the credits. Thank you in advance for not suing us, George. You know, <laughs> once troops came along, all over the net, they were just popping up right and left. Star Wars fan films, Star Wars fan films. People saw this and said, I want to do that, and it raised the bar so incredibly high. In 2002, I was 17 years old, and I was on Fan Films Forum, as it was called, uh, put on by TheForce.net. And also on the forum was a guy named Michael Dortman Scott. And so this community decided to come together with the idea of doing a lightsaber choreography competition. We were kind of like enemies on this forum. You know, I'm sure we sort of came off like dicks to each other all the time. And, and so there's public feuding. So we thought what would be funny is to actually have a literal fight against each other with lightsabers for this contest. So we got together and we met face to face for the first time to make the fight. And we shot the whole thing in a couple of weekends and did all the visual effects ourselves and everything and came in uh, in time for the deadline for the contest. And we won first place. And then uh, sort of completely outside of our own knowledge or power, it kind of went on to other places. And you gotta remember that this is well before YouTube was around or anything like that. The idea of going viral was because people are literally sending it to each other or it's getting posted on these big sites. The version of Ryan vs. Druckmann that's uploaded on YouTube is actually not uploaded by us. It's from a fan, Maniac Mike. And so by the time we found that we were on YouTube, it already had like five million views. And we were like, what is going on here? Still to this day hosted by Maniac Mike, whoever that is. Hey, Maniac Mike, how you doing? Rooster Teeth, the company I work for, it's a company founded on fan films and shows. I mean, Red vs. Blues, it's pretty much the longest running internet series there is, and it founded an entire company, but it's just fan fiction. It's just like recontextualizing Halo. I joined the Rooster Teeth community when I was 15 years old, after getting into Red vs. Blue when I was 14. It's really cool to see just how much web video has grown since the start of Rooster Teeth. I think they are huge pioneers in web video and web series. And we put out shows almost like a television network. We have stuff every day, multiple shows a day. I think right now we're close to 7 million subscribers on YouTube, which is a lot of people. Rooster Teeth has a very interesting philosophy, which is community comes first. Yes, we make all these videos and stuff, but the site is also a hub for people to come together with similar interests and to make friends. Out there is a bunch of people that work a nine to five job. But this weekend they're Thor, or they're Spider-Man, or they're getting to meet their idols. This is Christmas and the 4th of July and Las Vegas and a really cool summer blockbuster all just crammed into a weekend.
I am so profoundly grateful for these fans and the opportunity to do what I do. It's sort of been a long time dream of mine to start a fan film here in Halifax. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit about how does one form that passionate group of people and then um, take it all the way to like filling a soundstage full of sets and producing this thing that is pitch perfect start. You know what, surprisingly, it's a lot harder than you might think. So what I would say is if you're interested in doing it, don't look at your bank account, just do it. You know what I mean? Because you'll get discouraged. <laughs> what I did was just like, you know what? We need that, do it, get it. Just, you know, once you commit to something, you really have to commit full on. We won't harm you, we're your friends. You're on the Federation Starship Enterprise. I'm Captain Kirk. It's all right, it's all right. He's our chief of security, Drake. He won't harm you either. You know, I was thinking the other day, why do I love Star Trek so much? Why do I love Captain Kirk so much? I couldn't figure it out for a long time. I was like, why do I, why has this show taken such a hold on me for years? And then it hit me. I discovered Star Trek at the exact moment in my life when my parents divorced and my dad left. Nine years old, I find Star Trek on television and there was this strong, brave, male leader role model. I loved the friendship and the camaraderie that the characters had for each other. I was enamored with the stories. I started building things with my hands, making communicators out of cardboard and wood, making phasers. My mom taught me to use a sewing machine. I started making my own costumes. And then I started shooting my own little Star Trek episodes. The chance for that nine-year-old boy to step onto the bridge of the Enterprise in a perfect uniform on a perfect set is beyond belief. There could not be a better time for to be an independent filmmaker, to be a storyteller, because of the opportunities that we have for raising funds, for producing and creating our own vision without feeling like we have somebody over our shoulder looking at the almighty dollar and making every creative decision based on that. My film was inspired by kind of a painful process of transformation that I went through. And during that time, I rediscovered the X-Men Life Death books where Storm is also at her lowest point. I was in New York and I had a band and all of that and I kind of played the part of superhero when I was on stage. Throughout my whole life, there's been a lot of things I've had to overcome. And then after trying for a long time, I found out that I uh, was pregnant. To be a creature that can create life, that's amazing. You know, that's superhero. Um, and so anyway, I had this life inside of me, I had the second heartbeat, and then um, six months in, he was stillborn. There was a solid several months of, of depression and darkness. I was very angry at how all of that ended. I was very, I needed, I needed to battle something. I ended up in a mixed martial arts class. And then over the next few months, the transformation started happening in my spirit and obviously with my body as well, I started to feel empowered. I shaved my hair into a mohawk. I'd always done that during transformative times or crisis moments in my life. People started to call me Storm. All of these things kind of aligned at a time in my life when I'm bursting with all of this energy that came from the loss of my son. There's no like completely happy, well-adjusted superheroes. They all have something very wrong with them. There's always a tragedy. Something is driving them and it's always something dark. And so I can relate to that. I have that.
This is the captain, condition yellow alert. Phaser crews stand by, deflector shields up. We're going in, gentlemen, peacefully, I hope, but peacefully or not, we're going in. Star Trek, Star Wars, sort of modern fandom was created off the back of those two franchises. By the 80s, 60% of the American public self-identifies in a Gallup poll as Star Trek fans. That's a case where fans built the franchise, not the other way around. So this is a show that almost got canceled at the end of each season, that fans rallied to keep alive. They organized nationally and locally to support the show uh, in a pre-internet era. You know, Paramount didn't know what the fuck to do with that. I'm sorry, we're not, we're not recording, right? <laughs> I think the fact is that Star Trek fandom never, ever died. Those original fans never gave up on it, and they always wanted to see more Star Trek. They'd watch it on television. They'd watch it on a movie screen. They'd watch it as a hologram, if you could deliver it that way. There was this big wave of people who loved Star Trek, who loved Get Smart, who loved Lost in Space, and all these other rather outlandish shows from the 60s, and they started showing up at these conventions. It all kind of coalesced around there and became this big pop culture explosion where the conventions fueled the uh, shows and the shows fueled the conventions. It was this nice little circle. Ladies, gentlemen, Miss Denise Crosby! You know, Star Trek may be bigger than ever now. Oftentimes, I've, I've seen three generations of people watching The Next Generation. It's time for difficult decisions. Opinions, please. I say put all available power into a full-out combined phaser and photon torpedo salvo. Destroy their ability to sustain this force field, sir. I was starting to get invited to all these conventions, and I started to come away thinking, I'm more interested in what these guys are doing. They, I know they're there to see me, but I'm fascinated. You mean you get together every year, you stay in touch. Sometimes some of you guys have gotten married. You and they're and they're engineers and scientists. You've gone into your professions inspired by this show. My friend Roger Nygaard, I think, basically got sick of hearing me talk about this and said, "We're going to make a documentary." And basically, that's what we did. We've been having this party now for years. It seems like every year it gets to be a little bit more fun. A couple more people come, and, you know, it started off small, and now the younger people are coming, and this year we had a girl come and everything. I think after Star Trek, Star Wars was the next step in fan evolution. Star Wars was also not a product that the studios thought was particularly important. It really was just a little science fiction movie actually kind of a little Western disguised as a little science fiction movie, which was also Star Trek, Wagon Train to the Stars. Two genres, very popular, put them together, and it's like Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Somewhere in space, this may all be happening right now. Star Wars, a billion years in the making, and it's coming to your galaxy this summer. 1976, partly out of desperation and partly out of inspiration, Lucasfilm started going to fan conventions because they had the feeling that no one knew how to market Star Wars. The movie theater bookers were not interested in the science fiction film because science fiction was dead. And that's how the buzz started. All of a sudden, on opening day at 32 theaters in North America, there were lines. And that's what attracted the media's attention. What the heck is this? This is a movie we didn't even know about. How do these people know about it? Why are these lines out there? And so it was that outreach to the fans. And Lucasfilm kept that up through the making of Return of the Jedi. They had an internal fan club. They had some people who were in charge of fan relations. And it's that legacy that, you know, decades later, the rest of Hollywood woke up to. God bless the Big Bang Theory. You know, why is that show so popular? Do you ever think about it? It's a bunch of nerds nerding out about pop culture. Why is it so popular? You know why? Because everybody loves that stuff. They've just always been afraid to admit it. Oh, don't tell anybody you like that stuff. You'll, you'll be a nerd, they'll make fun of you. What we're finding now is little by little, people are coming out of the woodwork and being brave enough to say, you know what? I like that. I enjoy that. Hi, I'm the Lord High Tech Monkey, and welcome to Geeks vs. Nerds, the debate style program where we investigate.
topics. Nobody else has the guts, tenacity, or interest to investigate. On Geeks vs. Nerds! This is your real first wave of Uber Geek. We co-opted culture at a ground level and then pulled it with us because we are the ones with the money. And we have made it acceptable to be a geek because there are more of us than there are of you now. So there you go. was meant for an entirely different generation of people. And so, like, that was a really furry butt that just showed up. I dreamt of what the future could be when I was a kid in terms of film and media, and we're right where I wanted it to go. When I started Ain't It Cool, I felt bad movies deserved to die. I discovered that I could begin to get people the word on film long before critics could. Hey folks, Harry here. Come on in. I've seen the Avengers and it fucking rules. What I wound up finding was that I was becoming a voice that seemed to be a whole lot of people's voices. Everyone's enjoying the Austin Comic Con, everybody's loving it. <laughs> Without further ado, let's bring out Robert Rodriguez. Harry and I thought of getting the rights to Fire and Ice. Who's seen the original Fire and Ice? I mean, I still love the movie. Oh, I love the movie. He... I love it. I was living the dream that every film geek was having. Thanks. What's up, Harry? Thanks, man. I appreciate it. And the media is writing stories about he's going to destroy the system of Hollywood as we know it, like revenge of the audience or something. Well, that quote single-handedly empowered me to be the voice of the audience. Hey, Harry, do you have a new hope for the new Star Wars? I feel great about it, and I think we're going to have a really fun Star Wars. Fans have always been there, and, and in vast numbers. But they were catered to and condescended to in equal measure, I think. No one ever took them seriously enough to think that they had an influence beyond being ticket buyers. Yeah, it's interesting, actually, that the relationship between fans and the objects of their affection has changed tremendously, again, because of online media. You can follow a movie star's Twitter account, and they really will talk to you. It really means something to their fans if you just mention them in your Twitter feed. If you say, hey guys, it's really great to see all of you. It's really great to know that you're there. You've made a connection that it, it's really hard to cultivate in any other way. Please give a big fan to Mr. Stanley. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, he needs no further introduction other than Joss. Hi, Joss. Uh, thank you for looking at me. <laughs> I was curious to know um, how you feel starting from Buffy, which you started in college, to now being a god of Comic Con. <laughs> that Joss Whedon's appeal is not even the sum total of everything he's done. It's the sum total of everything he is. He is the passionate fan guy who actually did exactly what every really passionate fan, guy or girl, would like to do. <laughs> well, the thing that's awesome about the Dr. Horrible phenomenon is that really was a personal thing. It was done by Joss Whedon, who was a professional with professional credibility. It was a little personal whim. 
that connected with people on a really powerful level. Laundry day, see you there, under things tumbling. Want to say, love your hair. That would be something I can't even imagine getting through a studio process, even with somebody like Joss Whedon behind it, because it's very idiosyncratic. It wasn't made to be a marketable commodity. It was just made to be, oh my God, I think this is so funny. <laughs> People who are attracted to certain properties and personalities like Joss Whedon will camp out to get a chance to ask not just Joss Whedon, but anybody deeply involved with the creative part of the show to talk about it. When the zombie apocalypse really does happen, how would you guys deal with it? Are you guys prepared? I would take over a hotel, spray paint myself silver, run around in circles naked and watch South Park. We know how important it is to interact with our fans. Aside from knowing that it's important, we really enjoy it. So if you're gonna go participate in the Walking Dead experience and you're gonna run a maze, we want you to run the maze that is authentic to the show. A giant nerdy fan. I, I saw George Romero the other night and still got that same flutter of like, that's the guy who did Dawn of the Dead. You know, I mean, it's it's that level of excitement and the passion, you know. The one thing that I love about The Walking Dead is every single person, every actor, every crew person has that same amount of passion. And collectively, that passion ignites this fantastic creative spirit. Last season, I got a letter from a girl who spent three pages describing what the ultimate zombie would be. And then I was getting ready to direct episode 15, and I literally said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that zombie. So I called the shop and I said, I need a torso made with the stomach all ripped open and the guts hanging out. The day that the episode aired, I pulled the letter out and I called the phone number. And I called the girl and I said, hey, this is Greg Nicotero. And she went, fuck you. And I go, seriously, she goes, you sound just like my friend, fuck you, and hung up. And I dialed the number again and I called her and I said, no, seriously, this is Greg Nicotero. And she went, all right, how do I really? So I had to like answer some question. And she said, wow, oh my God, really? And I said, listen, I want you to watch The Walking Dead tonight because your zombie's gonna be on it. To me, the fact that I could call this girl and say, your letter inspired me to want to make this creature for you so that you could watch the show and be like, that's my zombie. That's the zombie that I wanted on the show. I love it. Fandom has gone to a new level now, and I think that is largely due to the internet. I think psychologically something happens where our brain is telling us we are communicating with this person, and we are, and that feels normal and natural to us, like we know them. And in a way, we do know them. We know them better than people knew celebrities 20, 50, 30 years ago, certainly. I found the mother load. Mystery Science Theater 3000 short films on YouTube. There's like at least 50 of them. Seriously? Yes. <laughs> so don't, you don't mess me, because that wouldn't be funny. I wouldn't lie to you. My first show that really um, helped really made my career was Friday Night Lights. The, the writers for Heroes were fans of that show and they wrote a role and they said, wouldn't it be great if we could get the girl from Friday Night Lights? Which sort of made everything a lot easier. As an actor, I'll have months and months between jobs just because that's the way the industry works. And so you may as well go ahead and make your own stuff in the meantime and like screw the Hollywood system. This is your first road trip. I planned a very special scenic route. Only you would start a road trip on the first day of the apocalypse. One of the things that really helped with Best Friends Forever is that I have a lot of um, Twitter followers. And so 
when we were, um, we raised money for our post-production through Kickstarter and we were able, I was able to tweet out and we had all these people so nice and lovingly retweet us and post things about us and give money. And that was just an amazing thing that really helped us. It probably didn't used to matter how many Twitter followers or ha you had or what your social media reach was like, but now that TV is combining with web and we're getting, and there are web stars that are moving over into television and vice versa, I, I just think things are combining so much that it does matter that you have this social following and you are connected in a way. I feel like I've become, like I have become friends with some of these people because I think the line between being a fan and being a celebrity is totally blurred. The thing is that that is a very volatile relationship to try and manipulate. And if you're really good at doing it, you can increase both your fan base and the intensity of their fandom by giving them something, by giving them some kind of access. Having received all your letters over the years, and, and, and I've spoken to many of you, and some of you have traveled, you know, hundreds of miles uh, to be here, I'd just like to say, get a life, will you, people? <laughs> I, I mean, I, I mean, for crying out loud, it's, it's just a TV show. <laughs> William Shatner, who has been a huge fan favorite since the early 60s, when Star Trek was in its first run, and the fact that he is still a hugely popular attraction now speaks mostly to him as a personality. The whole idea is to have fun at a comic convention. Fans respond to that in him because they feel like this guy is actually for real. I think we've all seen the Star Trek skits, you know, in which he yells at them that they need to get a life and leave him alone. But I think that you can only make fun of that kind of thing if fans know you basically really do appreciate them. There's been what I call the new geek phenomenon, where a lot of websites are cropping up that are called, you know, geek chic or Geek World or Geek Aporium or whatever the hell they're called. And there are these big websites and they talk about geek geek, how cool it is, and they sell geek t-shirts. It's a new market. Instead of just 400 people in Cincinnati at the Star Trek convention, it's now 100,000 people or a million people all year long. This is a lot of people. I wonder how much stuff we can sell to them. That's why Comic-Con is embraced by Hollywood now and, you know, these massive um, showings of new product and new series being leaked and everything. They're desperate to, to grab on to this instantaneous fan base. <laughs> What happened in the last 15 years is with the discovery of comics by movies and video games and all of these other media outlets, it's drawn in the whole constellation of Hollywood and technology companies publishing all aspects of the media world, both of the old media and the new media. What used to be the province of just, you know, obsessives and nerds and geeks and things like that has become the driving influence of all of these different creative businesses with billions of dollars of economic opportunity lined up behind it. And the combination of those things really, I think, caught Hollywood in the sweet spot of, um, you know, greed and opportunity. In addition to the canonical, you know, Spider-Man and X-Men and things like that, these properties that were not top-line properties were getting developed into pretty big and successful films. So I think every artist in Artist Alley thought, well, I could be next. comic book writers and artists who started out as fans and made the transition to professional. Um, to them, they were still fans when they were professional, and it was a big honor to them, or a big kick, to create a character that would suddenly have its own Marvel comic book title, you know, or DC comic book title. Now they're making $100 million movies based on those characters, and the people who created those characters aren't getting anything. U.S. law has been pretty unfavorable to the little creator. It's fairly easy to write a contract that strips the person of any possible claim forever. Artist Alley is actually littered with a lot of older creators who gave their best work under these work for hire agreements and then find out that they are being sued by one of the largest and richest companies on the face of the earth for daring to suggest that they created a character whose origin they told, whose costume they designed, whose first exploits that they, that they scripted. 
when I worked for Marvel Comics in DC, I, I used pre-existing characters. I wrote Captain America, and I wrote, uh, you know, a Thor issue, you know, it's things that, that people know. I did create some characters for Gold Key Comics. I created Dagar the Invincible, a sword and sorcery character, the occult files of Dr. Spector, and I created Trag and the Sky Gods. But those I knew I was not gonna own. And to me, at the time, it was a big deal. Again, getting my own comic book, even though I didn't own it. I did an Empire Strikes Back that was based on the second Star Wars movie. And uh, it was a crappy deal. But they basically told me uh, people would pay us to let them write this book. So I did it, and it's open, it still opens doors. From Kenner's Star Wars collection comes the Stormtrooper, the Sand People, and all 20 action figures, including new Hammerhead, Snaggletooth, and more, each sold separately. It's Darth Vader, watch out! There's even Chewbacca and Han Solo. Now I know the Force is with us. Star Wars was really the first successful licensed movie. The licensing business at that point was about $6 billion a year worldwide. Ten years after Star Wars, it was $66 billion. That was the great first recognition of how much stuff you could sell people and how much they would buy and then come back to buy some more or they'd come back to buy a double of it so they could keep the first one in the box and not spoil it. You in Rebel Starship Corridor 1138. Yeah? What are you doing there? Well, I I'm just showing these well, guys... Well, see some identification. Uh, you don't need to see my identification. We don't need to see their identification. Move on. Yeah, Move on. yeah. Somehow I ended up with the world's largest collection of Star Wars memorabilia. Now certified by the Guinness World Records book. Um, and we decided to turn what was my private collection into more of a public institution as a nonprofit. If you're talking about the total reach of Star Wars, you're talking about $25 billion of retail merchandise sold over the history of Star Wars worldwide. There's so many kinds of different fans, but I think they're all tied together by their love for the movies and the stories and the characters and the fun. As a kid, I got something to do with Star Wars and I was happy. No matter how much they spent on it, it could have been just like a one pound thing that they got and I'd have been over the moon. I'd, I'd get home from school, I'd go upstairs, I'd be drawing Star Wars, I'd make my own Star Wars comics, models, things like that. It's an escapism. A lot of people have got probably sort of get bullied at school, like I used to get really bullied at school. And Star Wars was a way of escaping. And I met a few people that liked Star Wars and we sort of end up clubbing together. And then the bullies stopped because there was a few more of us then. And when we decided, well, oh, so I'm going to try a few of these moves on them, and they stopped it. Everybody said, oh, you should have grown out of Star Wars by now. I thought, no, <laughs> why should I? <laughs> now, this is where I do the main work. This is basically where I spend most of my time. When the DVDs come out of Star Wars and I saw how terrible they looked, how can they say that them colours are right? No way. There are some serious problems with them. And I thought, I've got to do something to something with this. And I fact went on an original trilogy.com, um, found a few people that were doing fan edits. I saw their edit and thought, hmm, they've changed the special editions a bit. I think, oh, I might do that myself. Well, I've never done effects before, never used effects software before. And I thought, well, I'll give it a go. Then other people started saying, cool, could you fix this problem? And then it just went, boom. It went a bit mental. <laughs> Fans are nitpickers. It's just the way they always are. And why do people make a fan film? They make a fan film because something, I like what you have, but there's something missing. That's the original, and that's the, the updated version with the speeder flap. I've added the flap in to match the model, so when it's actually moving in the direction, the flap should open. It fixes a bit of a continuity problem. He goes through it and catalogs, you know what? 
you had a third guy over here, and then you cut it over here, and he's not there anymore. So I'm going to fix it. Originally, I was just going to do color correction. Just color correct the films, fix a few of the lightsaber issues. That was it. And that was what, around about 2003 when I first thought about it. I'm just somebody in the bedroom, sort of on the computer, doing some effects work. I wouldn't have the patience. I don't know how, how he does. This one's taken, what, five, six years, something like that. So if I've got another four to do, that's gonna, I'm going to be late 50s by the time I finish that. So I've got to go back to doing it for the first one again, because I only did it in standard def because there was only the DVDs at the time, so I've got to do all them again now. But there's a few things I wanted to change anyway because I wasn't happy with them. I've got to sound like George Lucas now. <laughs> when fans started putting out fan movies out there, you might have gotten someone at Lucasfilm in, in, in legal who said, oh my god, we got to stop this stuff. And, you know, George's response and the, and the response of the vice president of marketing was, no. Why don't we run our own fan film contest? Why don't we have fans make more films? And let's give them prizes. And let's have one that George himself picks. But they had a very specific meaning in mind. It had to be parodies or documentaries, not the kinds of things that the other people are making, telling news stories, telling stories that may be critical but are not parodies. Those things were already fair use, and they just wanted it to be on Lucasfilm's website and have the makers give overall control to them. George Lucas was never afraid to let fans have a sense of ownership of Star Wars, and that's what makes the company's intellectual property, just Star Wars, worth $4 billion to the Walt Disney Company. So this is so interesting to me because Lucasfilm has historically been incredibly aggressive. So they sued people for using the phrase Star Wars to describe Reagan's SDI initiative, the Strategic Defense Initiative. And they lost. Lucasfilm lost this porn case. Um, they did send uh, cease and desist letters. They said that they wouldn't tolerate, you know, sexually explicit fan fiction, which of course they ultimately did because um, it happens whether or not you want to tolerate it. So is Disney going to be worse? It's hard for me to imagine how. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, Disney too is not immune to the changes sweeping the industry. So I think Disney uh, is capable of recognizing when uh, it should back off of fair use. In one sense, the minute you send your baby out into the world, it belongs to everybody, in one sense. It's no longer George Lucas's Star Wars. The world has uh, absorbed and embraced Star Wars, and it's part of the zeitgeist. But that doesn't mean he didn't create it. He created it. They didn't. He owns it. They don't. They can collect it. They can appreciate it. They can fantasize about it. They can even devise their own stories about it if they choose. But they can't steal it. Culture is always built on culture. People have always taken the stories that were significant to them and retold them. Romeo and Juliet was a piece of fan fiction. And so many of Shakespeare's plays were adding to or expanding upon existing cultural material. Shakespeare and Dante and the Bible, you know, are what is known as meta-narratives. And they're ancient meta-narratives, you know, that later on went to influence things like uh, Star Wars. We've always taken the stories that were most important to us, the heroes are most important to us, told it around the campfire, added our own elements to it. The difference is that the stories today no longer belong to the folk, they belong to the studios. The last extension of copyright in the United States was in 1998, when the first Mickey Mouse film, which was itself the parody of the Buster Keaton film, when that was about to go into the public domain, that is when copyright got extended. Supposedly, the concept of copyright 
was to protect the owners for a finite period of time. And these laws were devised a long time ago when people didn't live as long as they do today. But they also were devised when creations were owned by individuals and not by corporations. And this is where things get fuzzy and where the ethics uh, uh, and morals uh, become debatable issues. I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope, it's home to work we go. I hope. Disney has long taken folk tales, fairy tales, turned them into motion pictures, and sought to then constrain what people could do with those stories. And it's claimed ownership over more and more of the children's culture in the United States. By extending copyright protection decades beyond what it originally was in, when the Constitution was first written. And to create the so-called Mickey Mouse Protection Act, which is modern American copyright law, is to sort of squeeze out any legitimate space of grassroots creativity. They got to capitalize on the ideas that had come before them. But when it came their time to put their work back into the public domain, they decided to change the rules at that point. So yeah, there's, there's rich hypocrisy there for sure. Societies suffer uh, when you start uh, restricting ownership of ideas and narratives. And when a small group of people controls it all and decides how it should be disseminated, rather than having things happen from the grassroots. I think it's wrong to paint it as the good guys and the bad guys. It really isn't that simple. Most projects take years of someone's life. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of passion. There's either hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars can be spent. So when you're talking about that scale of investment, then to say, well, I've done, I've spent all that money and all that time, and you're just going to go take it. Look at it from their point of view. Another way to look at it is, let's say you own this beautiful Ferrari, and the 12-year-old next door hot wires it and takes it for a joyride. Even if he fills it up with the, the tank and brings it back without a scratch and even gives it a little hand polish, you're still going to be pissed off. And that's exactly how these people feel about it. Because, OK, you took our franchise for a joyride. You didn't harm it, but it's ours. Copyright infringement, um, if it's willful, can be punished uh, by you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. So it's very scary for someone to get a cease and desist letter. His heart was tortured with longing for what he had lost and with hatred for the thief who took it, Bilbo Baggins. The Hunt for Gollum is a project about filmmakers and fans coming together to make an extra piece of The Lord of the Rings. It was a labor of love and actually took two years to make. Hunt for Gollum has uh, got to be like top five best fan films ever made. I mean, the story is good, the, the look is right, the actors look like the people you saw in the Peter Jackson movies, which is just amazing. They were clearly just having a, a blast doing it, see, which is why you do it. The Hunt for Gollum was released purely on the internet. On the first night, it had half a million views. After the first weekend on YouTube, it got another two million views. I think now, a few years later, it's up in the 15 to 20 million range, which is um, kind of astronomical to think that many people have seen our film. One of the reasons I made The Hunt for Gollum was because I'm incredibly passionate about Tolkien. People question, how were you allowed to make a film set in Middle-earth with these characters? They're thieves. They're thieves. They're filthy metal thieves. The answer is technically we weren't. Um, we were a bunch of fans, DIY filmmakers, going out there and shooting this thing and putting clips online. And that led to Tolkien Enterprises finding out about the film, calling me and saying, well, we're not really sure what you're trying to do here. Are you stealing our intellectual property? Are you infringing our copyrights and, and trademarks? 
the rules that we kind of agreed with them were that the film was going to be for free release to the internet. And that was the most critical factor. And also that we were being respectful to the trademarks and to the copyrighted works. Once we came to this kind of agreement with them, then it was allowed to go forward and the film was allowed to be released. For us as filmmakers, it was a bit of a scary process to go through because we put so much of our time and energy into this project that uh, it would have been pretty soul-destroying if they had uh, shut the film down, and I think they could have. At the moment, what you've got is this real tension between consolidation at the top of the industry, where all of the money is coming into these giant companies, Disney, which bought Marvel for $4 billion a few years ago, and you know NBC, Universal, and all of these giant companies that own all of the production and all of the distribution. But at the same time, you've got better tools than ever at the bottom of the pyramid, so that anybody with a great idea can do work with really great production value. And then they can get out without asking anybody's permission. They can get out onto the internet and get seen by millions of people. Right now, these worlds are coexisting. But I think if that pie ever starts shrinking, you're going to see a real conflict erupt between who's going to be driving the bus. Is it going to be the big guys? Or is it going to be you know, the independent, creative, fan-driven voices? Every kid of our generation wanted to be Indiana Jones. These guys relived the movie in total. Well, it was completed and screened for friends and family in Gulfport, Mississippi in 1989. And we all kind of went our separate ways. And it was over. It sat on my shelf collecting dust for many, many years. And then our movie got discovered. Eli Roth had an old beaten VHS copy that he got through a good friend of his. You know, it started to kind of grow, and then he brought a copy down to Harry Knowles with Any Cool News and Button a Thon, and they dropped it in before the new Lord of the Rings film. That Button a Thon, Eli Roth gave me the tape. We played it during breakfast. Uh, the audience booed when we shut it off to play the premiere for Two Towers. How awesome is that? We're showing you the premiere of Two Towers, and you want to continue watching this grainy 30th generation dupe of a fan film made by a bunch of kids in Mississippi? You're kidding me. Hello? John? I'm going to blow up the ark, Renee. I mean, all of a sudden, we're, you know, working our crappy day jobs, and then we're thrust into the spotlight where, you know, Harry's three or four million readers. He posts this amazing review of us, and there was all this energy, you know, this, this like, sort of swarm. And we're, like, driving all over L.A. We're late for something, and Jason's in the back seat, and phone rings, and Eric passes me the phone. I'm just like, uh-huh, uh-huh, okay, all right. I look at Eric. He goes, who was that? It's like, um... So Steven Spielberg uh, called and uh, wants us to stop by his office. <laughs> he comes in and he's very casually dressed and just such a nice man and so warm. And, and he gave us some really nice compliments and then invited us into his office, which was like this cool kind of bungalow from Casablanca. And it was just like, I cannot believe I'm sitting here. This is just, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna pee. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna pee all over myself right now. <laughs> so what are you doing back here in Nepal? I need one of the pieces your father collected. The Raiders adaptation, it's so above and beyond that I think anybody would have to be foolish not to be flattered if something like that was done with their work. And I think our story has such a feel-good element to it. We were children. There were no release forms. We didn't know what we were doing. It was in this sort of like very small town atmosphere with a Betamax camera and before the advent of home entertainment. So there's a purity there and I think that's why a lot of people want to see it. So then the question is, what do we do with it in terms of do we make money from it? And that's when people can get into trouble. From the beginning, Eric and I built in a charitable component to it. 
which has been the cornerstone of why we've been able to navigate our film. So it's like, okay, here's all this attention. There are thousands and thousands of people all around the world that want to see our little movie. Go figure, it's weird. So what are we gonna do with it? We've raised a lot of money for kids and educational institutes and museums and schools and all those sorts of things. So here we are supporting the brand in a non-mocking way. We're raising money and putting it all back into you know, good social things. We're getting what we want, which is cool exposure, building a platform for us to kind of brand ourselves and get out there as filmmakers ourselves to go and do original projects, <laughs> God forbid. It's a different kind of energy that comes in and goes, you can't do that, stop that. We've taken this fan film, little fan film thing to just about as far as you can go without a cease or desist. Many of the larger corporations have become much more sensible about this over the past few years because uh, they have noticed that fans bring in money. So the idea of threatening your fans and making them feel bad about your franchise and making anybody who hears about it feel bad, that's not a sound business decision. Think about Frozen, right? So if you want to see, um, you know, the weather guy singing his parody of Let It Go to explain why you shouldn't go out in the snow, that thing has a million YouTube hits. And it's still up there. Just don't go, just don't go. I am one where the ways high and by. If you want to see Let It Go sung in 50 different languages, that's on YouTube too. Me anyway. If you look at something like Glee, there are you know thousands of music videos produced by fans on YouTube coming out often a week after a Glee episode airs, either lip syncing to their songs or doing their own dub to their songs. We know the studio could have sent cease and desist letters there. It didn't. Now why? Well, if you look, the Glee cast in its first two years had more number one hits on iTunes than the Beatles and Elvis had in their career. Glee producers would be idiots to send cease and desist letters. The real switch is this switch in the mentality of control to the mentality of, you know, if there's money, I want it. There's a fan film called Power Slash Ranger. Kind of took a dark take of that universe. Here's the extra bloody, extra sexed up edition of, of a children's show. <laughs> It was on Vimeo, it was on YouTube. The people that own the license didn't really like the dark take. They forced it down. The creators went online, did a little campaigning, saying, hey, fans, help us out. It becomes this big publicity thing. And this is somebody who's pr produced not just one professional Hollywood movie, but a lot of them. You can say it's revisioning, but on the other hand, you could just put different names on all these characters and it's suddenly not Power Rangers and you would own the whole thing. So how come you did it this way? You're always going to have people on the fringes that are extremist on one end or another. And uh, that gets a lot of publicity and that gets a lot of press. You have to make the thing that people want to share on Facebook and want to post on their blog and their website and things like that. I think a really interesting example of how fans are influencing media nowadays is Kickstarter. You don't need, you don't really need to, to go to Hollywood and convince some big dude in a suit to give you some money. All you need is the support of people that believe in what you're doing. A great story is a great story. And if you have the creativity to put something together that's compelling, you can find an audience. Based on a new business model, you can actually go out there instead of trying to reach the world, you reach that niche marketplace that maybe loves this particular kind of story or this kind of show. The Guild, Felicia Day, about a story about gamers. She put it online. She couldn't get arrested after she got off of uh, Buffy. And she put together this story about gamers. <sighs> so. It's uh, Friday night, and still jobless, yay. My therapist uh, broke up with me. Oh, yeah, there's a, there's a gnome warlock in my living room sleeping on my couch. They funded it themselves the first year. 
The second year, they ended up finding an economic mechanism by which fans could push a button and could help fund the show, which had never been done before. And then the third year, you had advertisers, Sprint, Microsoft, and they ended up with two to four million people watching that show. So it kind of built a new business model, a new way of creating something, delivering it to the audience, and building a relationship. And this is only the beginning. One of the great things about Kickstarter and Indiegogo and various other platforms is that they actually allow everybody to be a producer. What Kickstarter does is make it possible for a whole lot of people to pony up $50 until it's, it's real money. I didn't know a lot about Kickstarter. I had the idea burst and had this moment of, this needs to happen, and then people responded. We raised about $20,000. Suddenly, this simple little handmade project was gonna be funded from the outside. The first day on set, I remember showing up at some ungodly hour in the morning and pulling up in front of the studio, and there was probably 30 people on set, most of whom I didn't know. There was entire crews of people involved. Action. Fan film creators have gotten smart. I can go to YouTube and see how to do this special effect for my fan film. Or I can go to this website and, oh, I can do this for my fan film. So it seems like all these people are starting to come together again for this little thing called the interwebs. And it's all starting to, you know, mesh and it's starting to grow and it's starting to get more sophisticated. These fan films are becoming highly sophisticated. I'm actually doing a new one called XNR, which is bringing together all top professionals, an amazing director, uh, some really, really wonderful professional actors. They're raising hundreds of thousands of dollars where these things used to be done for ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 in somebody's backyard. I'm looking at this and going, my God, this could be a full-blown movie. And it's a fan film. The special effects are outstanding. The, the makeup is outstanding. Um, this is what fans want to see. Fan film started out as a real reactionary thing. And once it gets to be that amount of money, it's no longer reactionary. It's emblematic. It's trying to be the same thing. If you're going to raise $100,000, take half of it and make Star Trek, and take the other half and make something new, man. There is a huge Star Trek audience that's hungry. So guess what? There's two or three different groups making these fan films, and I think the next step will be Paramount saying, let's make a licensing deal. You're, gonna, you're reaching millions of people, monetize it, you get to make money, pay your actors, and we also get to make a big chunk of money. It's actually going to serve them. They just haven't stepped out of their old thinking box yet. Here's Hollywood, here's fan films. So, all right, maybe Hollywood's gonna look at the fan films and say, maybe we'll hire these people to make these films. The costs have come down, so the average person can now make a higher quality production and get it out there themselves, and that never was possible before. That doesn't, in my mind, though, nat naturally lead to the fact that you have any better chance of success or any better chance of, of entry or knocking down barriers. On the one hand, anybody can pick up a high-end digital camera and make a movie, but that doesn't mean everybody should. <laughs> We all want to show off, right? We make a movie on a set property, and uh, the people that are interested in that set property might watch that. If you do it well enough, they'll wonder what you're going to do next. If you're making something original and unique and cool, then people will be interested in it. They'll want to share it with other people. It'll become popular, and then you'll get noticed. It's all done by word of mouth. It's all by your best friend going, hey, hey, I saw this. Have you seen this? You go and watch this right now. You can't stop a groundswell. You can't put everything back in the box. Once the box has been opened, it's opened. In the 1980s, George Lucas was talking about garage filmmakers and how they were going to change the world. 
and how something that was going to happen in a garage was going to light the world's imagination. I think it happened. The fan filmmakers are going to be the next level of professional filmmakers, and I think studios could see this as the cheapest talent search they could possibly ever do. In addition to the Ryan vs. Darkman films, I've also ended up working for Stargate Studios. I got the privilege of working on a great number of different uh, television shows. One of the most fun projects to work on was Heroes. I worked on almost every single episode of the entire run of the show. We got to, in large part, design a lot of the effects. So I'm sort of personally responsible for developing two or three of the different superpower looks in the show. I definitely have a deep fandom. And what was fun about being able to actually work in the real industry now is that I'll bump into projects that I'm a fan of and get to participate in them. You know, one of the best things that's happened with Best Friends Forever is had people reach out to me and be like, you made me want to make a, a movie, a feature film. And especially like when I meet women who are younger than me and they're doing this and I'm like, do it, do it. Do not wait around for years. Cause I did that for so many years. I came to Los Angeles and my career took off pretty quickly. And then I felt like everything should just come to me. Like it should just fall into my lap. That's not the way it works. And I think the way around that is sort of making your own content and making your own stuff. And we just need to get off our butts and do it and do it ourselves. Fan films ultimately are about not being a passive viewer and not just watching and intaking it. It's saying, oh, I have something to contribute to, and it's about output. All hands, this is the captain. I'm about to violate a direct order from Starfleet Command. I take full responsibility for this action, and my log will reflect that none of the crew are complicit. Star Trek inspired me to try something that I found I was good at. And I tell fans the same thing. You kids, you watched some show, and you loved the costume, and you wanted to try to make it, and you found that you were really good at making it. Or it inspired you to write your own story, and you'd never written anything before, and you found you were really good at it. I love that. That cycle of having had something in my life that inspired me when I was little, and now I get to be a part of something that inspires kids. It blows me away, and it goes way beyond any kind of fame or celebrity or monetary gain. It's so much bigger than that. I've spent my whole life doing Raiders. I constantly get bombarded with questions like, Aren't you tired of playing Indiana Jones now that you're in your 40s? Stop it, you know? But like, if somebody says, hey, we want to write a book about you. OK, cool. So my story perpetuates. I was on a book tour, and Park City was one of the places I ended up for a dual screening there in Salt Lake. And it was in the same theater that Napoleon Dynamite premiered at Sundance. And Jeremy Kuhn was there, and he introduced himself and said, I have been trying to see your movie for so long. And he bought a copy of the book and like literally read the whole thing like overnight. We went out to dinner and we just talked. He's like, I'd love to do something with it. And so we're forging ahead with the documentary and then hopefully it will give way to the narrative feature. And then that's where we have to deal with the powers that be, which is Lucasfilm and Disney. <coughs> and for me, I'm staying hopeful because I think there's no better time I think Disney is probably going to be a lot more entrepreneurial than we think. A lot of it comes back to probably George, you know, sitting on a board, you know, signing off on it. It's just obviously better to have their blessing. Yes, you can do this. Two, one, action. the first X-Men movie and I loved it, but there was something missing for me. It wasn't made for me. I am not their target audience. If you really believe that women don't care or that there's no black female audience, then okay, I'm gonna produce this little thing over here and if maybe it gets three million YouTube hits in a month or whatever ends up happening, pay attention. I'm running your test films for you. I'm finding your other audiences. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> you know? I mean, thank you, and you're welcome. 
if someone does something different, if someone does something new, something that Hollywood hasn't done, and uh, that's, that's pretty enjoyable for me. I think over the next decades, and as the internet continues to change, and as crowdfunding, and fan films, and fan art continues to evolve, it's going to continue to force us to reevaluate our beliefs and our principles about copyright, about the way we see stories, how we share them, and what's, what's allowed. It's still the Wild West out there, because I think everybody's still asking themselves, how do I get noticed, and how do I make money from getting noticed? You know, and I think it still comes down to telling a great story. And cut.